So um, the, the, the brand Audubon is, is forever confusing to everybody, often including myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't help in New Orleans. There's also the Audubon Nature Institute that runs the zoo and the aquarium and other facilities. And of course, it's not National Audubon Society, as most of you probably know. Um, and a National Audubon Society also has state or regional offices. So the region, the state office of Audubon, Louisiana, was created in 2012. Um, even though we've had resources here in Louisiana for years, of course, the two chapters, which are affiliates of the National Audubon Society, but their own functioning separate 501c3s. Um, so Audubon, Louisiana is now merged with two other state offices in the region, the Mississippi and the Arkansas state offices to form one umbrella regional office of the National Audubon Society that we're calling Audubon Delta. Uh, with the idea that the word Delta doesn't just reflect like the bird's foot Delta, but um, goes much further up all the way to, to Cairo, Illinois. Um, so that again, the three states are, are Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Um, there are other Audubon assets and staff in those states. Collectively, we're about 30 staff. Um, across three states with Louisiana having about half of those. Um, we have education centers in Pasigula River in uh, um, Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center. Um, and then the Little Rock Audubon Center, which I actually got to visit while I heard, while I evacuated Hurricane Ida. Um, <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a nice expedition. Um, yeah, so anyway, so we're, we're still doing what we've been doing, right? We're focused on coastal restoration and management, advocacy, science, policy. Um, we're, uh, we have people working on advancing the renewable energy initiatives of the region. Um, there's some really great work going on in New Orleans with uh, uh, the, the city council passing a resolution um, to go uh, uh, at least carbon neutral, if, if not um, completely renewable by 2040. Uh, we have various programs of, of native plants for birds. Um, with this merger, we've been able to identify a single person who's gonna lead that program forward, as opposed to just a few of us doing a little bit of it, um, a little bit of it here and there. So we're hoping to kind of launch that even, even more in depth um, going forward. So as part of this merger, we brought on a new executive director, uh, Don O'Neill, uh, who is a PhD in, in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, she's had over a decade working for nonprofits, uh, managing strategic initiatives, uh, most recently for the Nature Conservancy. So it brings an incredible amount of talent to our region. Um, and so we're still, um, you know, getting her up and running. She just started about uh, a little over a month ago. And um, so it'll be a, an exciting direction to, to, to help, you know, codify what this, what this Delta region looks like. Um, like I mentioned, we have, you know, 30 staff, so we can share resources much more effectively and um, across these regions. Our coastal stewardship programs in Mississippi and Louisiana are um, finding ways of, of of more, you know, um, uh, effectively collecting data that tell bigger stories about coastal restoration and land loss and human disturbance. And we're developing a lower Mississippi River conservation blueprint um, to highlight what the conservation needs are in the region going further up the river than just the coast. Um, and so that'll be a big initiative for Audubon going forward as well. So anyway, that's who Delta is. Um, when I'm all wrapped up, we'll set aside some time for questions if people want to ask about what this means, how people can be involved, um, that kind of thing. I'd be happy to talk about that. But the main presentation today is going to be focused on migratory birds in the Mississippi River. And so I'll talk a little bit about what the river means for birds, how birds use the river, uh, how, how birds use landscape, and then, of course, what we're doing here at the lower end of the river uh, to help migratory birds. So, of all the rivers of the world, we all know the Mississippi River is one of the biggest, right? That's not really news. One of the things that I find really interesting about the river is its orientation. 
It is a north-south river, unlike most of the other large rivers of the world, which means it plays a particularly important role for defining bird habitat and for facilitating bird migration. And um, I'll kind of walk you through the, the Mississippi water, uh, Mississippi River watershed and, and how it has sort of, how, how it's sort of created different habitats across the continent, right? So it drains more than 50%, 40% of, um, of the lower 48 uh, continental states. So it's a, obviously, hugely important, but it defines, it's, it's defined by many of these different kinds of regions with different kinds of birds, many of which we see only during the winter, uh, like common loons that come from the Northern Lakes region, up at the headwaters of the Mississippi. Uh, the prairie potholes to the west of that, of course, is, is the breadbasket for all the waterfowl that come down the Mississippi River and um, most of them end up in, in, in South Louisiana or, or throughout uh, Louisiana. Um, further to the west, the Great Plains are bisected by some of the tributaries of the of the Mississippi River, um, historically supporting really important grasslands. Um, and going into the bottomlands, of course, one of my favorites, the Prothonotary Warbler, is iconic of, of the lower river reaches. And the eastern forests, um, with all of its foothills and, and, and small rivers and tributaries, provide this really incredible diversity of songbirds like cerulean warblers and scarlet tanagers, many of whom were desperate to see every spring and fall migration as they're, as they're passing through. Uh, the Appalachians have a really unique bird community that's similar to the um, boreal forests in some ways. And you know, there's crossbills up in the up in the Appalachian, but of course they support things like hermit thrush that also come to winter in Louisiana. Closer to home, the piney woods are, are home to things like brown-headed nuthatch and red-cockaded woodpecker. And as we get further further south to the coastal plains, these important southern grasslands support wintering populations of Henslow sparrows. How many of you notice that there's a band on this bird's leg? Uh, yeah, that was one of one of my one of my study birds uh, way back when, and um, yeah, here of course the, the the river meets the Gulf of Mexico in this incredibly productive estuary, uh, which in itself isn't just one habitat, right? It's this incredible diversity of of saltwater to intermediate to freshwater wetlands to chenilles to um, you know all the familiar habitats of South Louisiana. So altogether, right, this is an incredible diversity of birds and, and habitat. Excuse me a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Didn't put my, um, my door on mute. Um, yeah, so the, the, this, you know, obviously has an incredible diversity of, of habitats and, um, you know, really defines the, the bird life of the Eastern United States. And of course, the Mississippi River is bigger than that too, right? It connects migratory birds from as far as the Arctic Circle all the way down to Southern South America, like the buff-breasted uh, sandpiper, um, which primarily uses the Mississippi Flyway uh, throughout North America as it's making its journey north and south. Um, and so this aspect of the north-south orientation of the river um, and the way it is sort of centrally located in the continent, its connection to the Gulf of Mexico, its connection to Central and South America, um, provides an incredible migration spectacle that many of us get to enjoy here in Louisiana. Um, this is a, a, a graphic that was put together by the geniuses at Cornell that each point represents a different kind of bird, a different species. Um, I believe there's 121 points on this map. Quickly count them up and correct me if I'm wrong. But you can see the concentration of those points. Those are the centroids of birds' distributions as they're making their migrations. Um, so that central part of the United States, the Mississippi Flyway, is, is really, you just can't emphasize enough just how important it is. And of course, it's a whole variety of birds, from raptors to waterfowl to hummingbirds to songbirds. So it really, really is a um, defining characteristic of the continent. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about bird, bird migration, right? It, it, in it in itself is incredibly fascinating. Why do birds do it? Of course, the, the short answer is because of food and um, to, to successfully breed and raise their young. Birds all, they do it in different ways. There are different types of migration. There are different strategies that birds have evolved to, to do in order to migrate successfully. Throughout the bird um, taxonomy, the, the types of uh, migration has evolved multiple times, right? It's not just one ancestor of bird that figured out how to migrate. Different kinds of birds have figured out different ways of migrating. And so there are different strategies. Most people think about this idea of complete migration, where birds are all individuals of a species are genetically programmed to go north and south um, along, along different latitudes. Of course, there are elevational migrants as well. So these are birds particularly more so in the tropics, but also to some degree in the Rocky Mountains, uh, like rosy finches, and to a lesser degree, even in the, uh, in the Appalachians. Things like black-capped chickadees will go up and down slope in the winter. That's a type of elevational migration. You have partial migrations, where some individuals of a population don't migrate and others do. So a lot of our coastal seabirds uh, actually um, exhibit this kind of migration. So some of our brown pelicans stay throughout the northern Gulf of Mexico year round, whereas others migrate across the Gulf of Mexico into the Caribbean and, and southern Mexico. Um, royal terns, black skimmers, the more we're learning about the, my, the movements of those birds, the more that we're finding out that those species are also partial migrants. And then, then we have eruptive migrants. So most of you got to experience the, you maybe experienced the, the pine siskin migration last year in Louisiana. We don't get pine siskins every winter. That's an example of an eruptive migration. And what happens is um, you have these years up north where the, the food resources are really abundant. The birds are doing well. They don't need to migrate as much. They're producing lots of babies. And then you have these really cyclical patterns where the food crashes. And that forces birds further south than they normally would migrate. Um, and so we've been seeing that on and off over the last, well, millennia really, but last year was a great pine siskin year. Um, we're starting to see evidence that um, even gross beaks uh, have have recovered in their population to some degree, um, and then you know that's potentially uh, um, you know a lot of us are optimistic that we're going to see more even gross beak eruptions further south over the coming years um, because they've had a number of really good breeding success years in the Northeast. So yeah, lots of different kinds of migrations. It's like go on and on about all that. Um, but some birds, like hawks, they migrate during the day. They take advantage of the sun's thermal energy to get lift up into the air, and then they peel off those thermals and head south in fall or head north in spring. Other birds, like songbirds, migrate at night. I would encourage everybody, tomorrow night, when this front comes through, we're going to have a nearly full moon. Put your binoculars or put your spotting scope or put your camera up to the moon and watch bird migration. It should be... It's not going to look exactly like this. The birds don't hold still, right? They're, they're flying across the, the moon. But um, literally, you can see birds crossing the moon, even with binoculars, with, with uh, pretty decent, you know, pretty normal binoculars. So you can even watch bird migration by radar. And um, this is the perfect time of year to get into this. If, you, if you've never done it before, there are lots, lots of websites. If you were to type in bird migration radar or NEXRAD radar, you'd be able to find um, the radar uh, systems that show this. And all of these data are archived. You can go back in time and look at this too. And Cornell's BirdCast puts all of this information together um, to come up with real time uh, images of bird migration and um, even projecting for the next few days what bird migration is gonna look like. But you can see it in real time on radar. So this is an example of um, a, a, a spring night and this is 15 minutes after sundown and 30 minutes after sundown. Each one of these little donuts or birds lifting off the, off the ground, going into the atmosphere, being captured by radar. And of course, the, the way that the, the reason why it looks like a donut is because the radar's beam has a little bit of an angle 
coming off the ground. So it's not picking up birds right above the radar. It's not until the radar gets far, far enough away from the center to, does it until it starts picking up birds. So again, just kind of going back, this is, you know, sundown, 15 minutes later, and then 15 minutes later after that, just bird migration erupting. So we ought to see patterns like this um, tonight, a little to our north, and then tomorrow night uh, right here in South Louisiana. And the way birds orient themselves during migration. Um, you know, if you think, if going back to the Mississippi River, you think about how, how important that, that visual is for birds. But many songbirds, like I said, are migrating at night. So they're not necessarily using uh, ground-based maps. They're using compass mechanisms like polarized light or the orientation of stars or even the magnetic field of the earth. Um, and a lot of birds are probably using combinations of this. This is still an emerging field. Um, ornithologists are just starting to figure out what these mechanisms are. Um, in many songbirds, these are innate, innately pro programmed um, guidance mechanisms. But in other cases, it can be learned. Like cranes, um, a particularly good example are the whooping cranes that had to be taught how to migrate with a, a super light plane. Um, from Wisconsin to wintering grounds in Florida. And in the wild, birds, you know, adult birds are passing on that information to their offspring. They migrate as family groups. And so they are migrating during the day. They're learning that. They're seeing the geography. So again, just very different mechanisms depending on the kind of bird in terms of how they orient themselves and how they choose to migrate. Um, really neat study that uh, started to figure out um, how birds are, are, how small songbirds are, are orienting themselves during migration was, was this experiment with the European robin. Um, of course, with both eyes open, you can, you can put a bird in a little cage during the period of migration. This would be an example from spring where a bird in a cage, when the sun goes down, is just constantly trying to go, you know, trying to migrate north. And um, you can use little mechanisms in machine to detect where the bird is and when it's sort of going in, the, in that direction. And it turns out when they covered the right eye and they left the left eye open, that bird no longer knew where to go. It started randomly um, moving throughout the cage and didn't, didn't orient itself correctly in migration. But if you closed the left eye and left the right eye open, the bird suddenly reoriented itself and knew where to migrate. So there's something literally within the right eye. Nothing else was done to the bird, just something within the right eye that helps it orient itself during migration. Well, it turns out um, more evidence is, is being produced to suggest that they're actually seeing the electronic field of the earth. They have special sensors inside their eyes called uh, cryptochrome sensors, they're blue light sensors, um, that can actually detect magnetic, the magnetic field. Um, of course, we don't know exactly how, the, how birds see that, but this is one rendition of, of how it might look to a bird. So the, the strength of the magnetic field has these curvatures over the horizon, and depending on the orientation of, of where a bird is looking, the angle of that, of that light, right, of that magnetic field changes. And so it's that angle that we think birds are using to, to, or, to orient their, their, themselves during migration. Um, so just absolutely nuts. And these cryptochrome sensors are very highly concentrated, primarily in the right eye of at least several of the, of the birds that have been examined. So birds do this, right? Now it's, it's a matter of us to understand how they do it, right? We, we've known for, for decades that bird migration was, was a thing. We could see patterns of birds moving past us. But what individual birds do is still a, a really, um, um, you know, emerging field. And of course, Jennifer, with her swallowtail kite uh, work, is, is on the cutting edge of this kind of research as well. Um, in the early days, we didn't have those kind of really neat, you know, sophisticated satellite tracking um, technologies. Uh, the first example of an individual bird being tracked uh, for migration 
to, as far as I know, was in 1962 when these researchers put very high frequency tags, little small tags that send out a, a, a high frequency signal. They put them on Swainson's thrushes. And of course, you can't follow a bird while it's migrating on foot. You receive the tag with, a, with an antenna that detects the signal. So what they did instead is they jumped in their cars and they jumped uh, into an airplane and tried to follow the birds as best they could. And they actually successfully did so. So they had, they started to, uh, you know, identify these individual tracks of different birds. Um, of course, they could only go so far and, you know, they had only so much success, but it was the first sort of example of, yeah, we could actually start to figure out what individual birds are doing during migration. Um, and of course, the, the field has completely exploded since then. And, and, and right now, really starting over the last 10, 15 years, we've really entered this golden age because of all of the different technologies that have become available. Um, we have, of course, these Argo satellite transmitters that are being used on things like swallowtail kites. There are GPS transmitters. There's geolocators. I mentioned those very high frequency VHF radio transmitters. Uh, which now have these automated detection stations put out around the country. Um, there are other kinds of local track tracking technologies like RFID tags. So the world is our oyster. We can, we can ask questions about what birds are doing and try to match that to technologies that will start to give us some insights. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example from our prothonotary warbler uh, migration research that we, that we started here in Louisiana. Um, of course, we know that prothonotary warblers, they come in the spring, they arrive in the bottom of hardwood forests and the swamps, and um, they light up the swamp, being the beautiful swamp candles that they are. And then in the fall, after they've raised their young, they head south and, and you know, go to Central and, and South America. And, you know, we've known that for years, but the, the details of this uh, are really still unknown. And so we decided we were going to try to use geolocators to identify the migration tracks of individual birds and learn more about what they need in order to make these migrations. And geolocators are a very simple device, but miniaturized such that they only weigh 3% of a bird's body weight and a prothonotary warbler only weighs five pennies. So imagine what 3% of five pennies is. That's how small these geolocators are. They're basically a little battery, they're a data logger, and they're a light reader. And so what they're doing is they are taking time-stamped light readings every two minutes of the day and just logging that data. And so what you can do with that once you recover the data is you can figure out when sunrise and sunset is for every given day of the year and use that information to estimate latitude and longitude. So latitude is dictated by day length and longitude is dictated by solar noon. And um, so you can get accuracy to about 100, 200 kilometers twice a day, once at solar noon and once at solar midnight. And so you have to usually, you have to recover the bird a year later. You have to find the bird, recapture the bird, to get the geolocator. And so how does one catch a prothonotary warbler? Well, you use a very convincing decoy. And you play the bird's song with the speaker and it comes screaming in and you catch the bird. And hopefully it's the one that you wanted that has the geolocator that, that you deployed year before. Um, and so we actually had about 40% um, success of putting a geolocator on a bird and 40% of them came back with a functioning geolocator um, that we were able to extract, extract data from. And the first bird that was ever tracked, the first prothonotary that was ever tracked was, was done right here at Blue Bottom Swamp in Baton Rouge. Um, we worked with uh, the Baton Rouge Audubon Society on, on putting this together. And this bird, uh, which we've uh, is now famously known as Geodad, um, left Blue Bonnet Swamp in late July, flew across the Gulf of Mexico in mid-August, and then stayed in the Yucatan for a good month and a half before it started moving again first east to Cuba and then to Jamaica, where it spent another month 
and then finally made the overwater Caribbean crossing to Northwest Columbia. And so from there, it overwintered um, somewhere near the Panama border, left in early March and took only three weeks to get back. It left the Yucatan, the Yucatan Peninsula the night of March 23rd. And John Hartgrank, our, our steadfast volunteer at Blue Bonnet Swamp, heard his first prothonotary warbler of the year singing on the afternoon of March 24th. It was this bird. This bird not only crossed the Gulf of Mexico, but didn't stop on the coast and went right to within 100 meters of its previous year's nesting location. So we promptly dropped everything, put out our very convincing decoy and caught the bird and basically learned for the first time this migration route of an individual bird. It was a three and a half month fall migration. Just think about all of the places that bird needs in order to survive a year. Three weeks to come back, a minimum of 5,000 miles, a minimum of seven countries, and three major water crossings for a little bird that weighs the equivalent of five pennies. Pretty cool. So with the proof of concept, we established a working group of researchers who were also interested in doing this with prothonotary warblers. And collectively over the next few years, we deployed ge geolocators from six states and found that almost the entire population that we sampled from across the breeding range overwintered in Northern Columbia. We had no idea that this was gonna be the finding. We figured that Western birds would be wintering further west and Eastern birds would be wintering further east, but instead they all concentrated in Northern Columbia. So it's really important conservation implications, uh, what, it, you know, what these birds need in the winter, where they need it. Um, it helps us um, streamline limited conservation dollars. And with this information, there have already been uh, initiatives in Colombia to protect habitat that support prothonotary warblers using this study as an example. So we're really excited about that. The other thing we were able to show is that in um, fall migration, there were three really important hotspots uh, where birds both spent a lot of time and most of our, most of our birds from the study population um, spent that time. So it was the Yucatan, it was the lowlands of Honduras and, and uh, Guatemala and the lowlands of, of Costa Rica and Panama um, before they get to, to uh, Colombia. So this, this tracking, these tracking data can have really important implications for, for conservation. Here's just another way of looking at it. Louisiana supports something like a quarter of the world population. We know Louisiana is important. In migration, we know those three hotspots are important. And we know that Northern Columbia is important for winter. So again, we can really start to figure out how to spend conservation dollars if our goal is to protect the proponentary warbler. Of course, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other migratory species that need the same sort of help. In terms of the ecology of migration, like I mentioned that proponentary warbler story is really unique in the fact that the entire breeding population overwintered in a very small area. It's not the typical pattern. Um, most songbirds that have been tracked sh show a pattern more like this, more like the American Red Star, where indeed Western populations tend to, uh, in the breeding grounds, tend to spend the wintering areas in the further west parts of their range. And birds in the east would, would overwinter further east in the range. So yeah, I mentioned, you know, hundreds of these birds have these stories. Um, and migratory birds in particular are struggling. All of those, um, all of those little linkages that they need are starting to break down, um, given the, you know, all, all of the things that humans have done to the world. So many of you probably saw this paper that came out and all the media hype that came out. back. Sorry about that. My uh, computer just cut out. Do I have to reshare my screen? Yes. Okay. 
You got it? All right. Looking good. One, one of the downsides of living out in the country. Um, yeah, so so I was saying that, you know, migratory birds are, are really, really having challenges. The This paper came out a couple years ago. It's infamously known as the three billion birds loss paper. Um, so these researchers compile all of these, you know, data from Christmas bird count, from reading bird survey, from eBird, from radar data to show that three billion birds have have disappeared, or about one quarter of all of the birds in the U.S. and Canada have disappeared since the night since about 1970. And the predominant group of those three billion are migratory birds. So about 2.5 of those three billion birds are migratory birds. Um, habitat loss obviously is too, but it's not just the quantity of habitat; it's the quality. It, it's not just about um, how much land there is out there. It's all of those, it's the buildings that we were talking about in between. It's it's outdoor feral cats. Um, it's as these birds are migrating and entering areas that they may be unfamiliar with, um, the risk to their survivorship goes way up. And so um, there are lots of things that, that we need to do systematically uh, to help migratory birds and, and recover their populations. So again, this is an example of the prothonotary warbler, long-term populations decline, similar to the 3 billion bird loss situation, about 40% decline. It's not just habitat loss though, right? We, the bottom one hardwood forests of the um, lower Mississippi alluvial valley in the, in the coastal plain where they're predominantly found, they've outpaced the loss of habitat loss. And it turns out that the rate of decline is much better correlated with the loss of mangroves from the wintering grounds. Um, so again, suggesting that, that if we only focus our conservation efforts here locally in the United States and Canada, we're not gonna be successful in, in recovering migratory bird populations. It really is a hemispheric challenge. Um, the lower Mississippi Alluvial Valley along the river obviously is an incredibly productive landscape. 80% um, of it has disappeared since over about over a period of about 100 years. So that prothonotary warbler decline, that started in 1967, 68. The, the loss of habitat uh, to the LMAV way predates all of that. What we're seeing today in terms of prothonotary warbler numbers is probably minuscule compared to what there was when John James Audubon was uh, following the Mississippi River south to Louisiana. Um, and in fact, the, the lower Mississippi Alluvial Valley, like I said, hasn't changed all that much in terms of habitat quantity over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. So um, the trade-offs of this really productive um, agricultural system is that we've seen widespread declines of birds. We've even seen avian extinction, right? Ivory bill woodpecker and the backwoods warbler were, were species that were very dependent on this habitat. And so we can look to birds as indicators of, of how to enhance uh, ecosystem health. We know that healthy land, air, and water are not only good for birds, but they're good for people. Human populations are suffering up and down the Mississippi River, especially in the face of climate change. We're seeing more disastrous flooding. Um, we're seeing bigger stressors on the agricultural system itself. Um, the, both the, the market and the economy and the environmental situation is not going to be sustainable. And so we, need, we can look to birds to figure out ways of how to improve uh, the Mississippi River. And I want to sort of end by focusing down here in South Louisiana and, and what's kind of more in our, in our own backyards in terms of uh, what we have, what the opportunities are, what the challenges are. Um, some of you may have seen this. I worked with Van Remsen and others, Michael Seymour, um, to try to put together population estimates for, for, for the birds of coastal Louisiana. And we did that for every single state from Texas to Maine. 
and we figured out the proportion of the, of the US population that coastal Louisiana supported. This Delta estuary, <laughs> we all know it's important, but this actually puts it into some kind of perspective in terms of the quantification of it. Three quarters of the, of the hemispheric population of sandwich terns nest in coastal Louisiana. More than half of the global population of seaside sparrows nest in coastal Louisiana. One third of all of the brown pelicans, a bird that was once extinct in Louisiana in the 1960s, we now support one third of the Eastern US population. One that tells us an incredible um, you know, story about conservation and the ability to, to recover and the, and the um, resilience of this system. Um, but it's also, this is what we stand to lose if, if we do nothing. Um, if we if we allow this this these 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 trends of population decline and habitat loss to continue, and the solution to this is to look to what nature once did, um, and I'll get more into that. Right. So the land that that most of you are standing on right now didn't exist six thousand years ago. Some of the newest land in the world, uh, you know the. The southeastern Louisiana was built by the power of the Mississippi River. It built this incredibly estuary that supports that bird habitat, that three quarters of the world pop hemisphere population of sandwich terns. It built places like Grand Isle, and it did so very, very recently. Of course, the Mississippi River uh, didn't always used to be where it is today. It's flopped back and forth over those 6,000 years creating new estuary, estuary lobes and uh, new deltas. And as it found its newest path of, of least resistance every thousand years or so, it shifted course and created a new estuary, a new delta lobe. The old lobes go through this period of, of regression, of abandonment and detach, detach, detachment and some, uh, submergence. So as the river shifted course, it would abandon that headland. It would create these, these, these flanking headlands, these islands that eventually became detached as the marsh deteriorated without the sediment input of the river and eventually form a shoal, much like what we see a ship shoal is, is an example of, of that. And of course, our barrier island system is in this period of detachment. The Caminata headland in Elmer's Island is in that period of abandonment and places like the Bird's Foot Delta and um, the Atchafalaya and Wax Lake outlets are in the active delta phase. But mostly what we've done is we've narrowed the river into one path and prevented its, its banks from overflowing to provide that nutrient-rich, sediment-rich uh, slurry back into the wetlands to sustain them. And since the river has been levied off, we have been in this period for almost a century of, of wetland loss in South Louisiana. And um, a lot of people call this the oh crap map because that red is, is what we've lost. It's an equivalency to almost the size of Delaware in the last 80 years. So about 2000 square miles of land have been converted to open water. We got here through levees. It's been exacerbated by shipping and navigation channels that allow saltwater to intrude. It's further stressed through hurricanes, land subsidence, sea level rise, all of these things. And so here's an example from Grand Isle and the Caminata Headlands uh, due south of New Orleans from 1932 to 2011. It's just a microcosm of what much of coastal Louisiana is facing. And if we do nothing, um, the coastal master plan, which integrates some of the most advanced science incorporating sea level rise and hurricane projections, um, have different scenarios of land loss. This is from the 2017 plan. This is if we do nothing, right? But we're not doing nothing. I'll come back to this. I forgot I had this slide. This is the consequence, right? We've, uh, um, at Audubon, we've been measuring uh, bird numbers in Maurepas Swamp. Um, there's a really excellent study from Phil Stouffer's lab out of Southeastern uh, Louisiana University at the time, before he moved over to LSU, where David Fox and Jason Zoller did a whole series of, of really difficult 
point counts, point count surveys in Morapa Swamp. They boat to an area off Blind River and then slog through the swamp for hundreds of meters, you know, with, with water up to their bellies and chest to get to their points and count birds for 10 minutes and then move on to the next one. Those data are really excellent because we've been able to go back in 2019 and 2020 and revisit those very same points. And we have found that the prothonotary warbler in northern Perula populations have declined by 50% over the last 15 years, which is way outpaced the regional declines. We know the Moripa swamp is hurting and birds are telling us just how bad. Um, that is a swamp that needs to be reconnected to the river. It needs those nourishing sediments. It needs those nutrients. And fortunately, there are restoration projects in the works to make that happen. The Morpa um, diversion is, is being planned. It's been delayed for years. Um, I think I saw David Muth on the call. I would love to hear more about it from him um, if he would be willing, but I'll, I'll keep going for a little bit. Um, the other thing that we've done recently is we've developed a habitat suitability index of the Barataria Basin using bald eagle nesting data. Basically, what we've done is we've taken all of those aerial surveys that LDWF has done, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, with all of the known nest locations, and we've developed a relationship between those nest locations and the habitat that surrounds it. And then we can project forward using the coastal master plan maps how much of that habitat will still be there with and without restoration action. And we've been able to demonstrate that in 20 years, with restoration action, we will have more bald eagle nesting sites than we will without restoration action. The same is true if we project forward to 50 years. The overall scenario is still a decline, but we can slow it, we can um, give us more time to uh, deal with the underlying issues of the levees, of climate change, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that restoration plan is absolutely crucial, uh, not only to human communities, but to birds. And these are some of the, the, the versions that are being planned. Many of you have probably heard about these. The existing ones are this, this Davis Pond and Carnarvon freshwater diversions. Both of these are building land and, and re-nourishing land, even though that's not what they were designed to do. There are much larger diversions planned. Um, the, the draft environmental impact statement has been out for public review for the mid Barataria sediment diversion, which is due south of New Orleans. It would rebuild these, these wetlands in, in the upper Barataria basin. And just coming down the road, we're anticipating an environmental impact statement and draft EIS for the mid Breton sediment diversion coming up in the next year, plus or minus. Um, and there'll be opportunity for the public to comment on that. One of the things that I took away from the mid Barataria sediment diversion was just how science rich it was. It left very little doubt um, in my mind just how successful it would be. And, um, and, and, and it was just an incredibly well put together EIS. Um, and so we really, really need to utilize the river to, uh, to rebuild the wetlands. It's once it's what builds this land that we're standing on today, and it's what we have to rebuild it going forward. So a sediment diversion, for those who haven't heard of it, is just a, a strategically placed water control structure uh, that will have pulsed operations that will be turned on and off to reintroduce the river uh, back into the wetlands, maximizing the sediment delivery. So tons of modeling work, an incredible amount of science have gone into understanding the, the, the sediment flows in the Mississippi River and how to capture those and how to deliver those into the wetlands. And so the mid Barataria sediment diversion, mid Breton sediment diversion um, have been designed with that, with that um, science and planning in mind. The mid Barataria was conceptualized in 1984. That's how long people have been studying it. And we're finally getting to a place where construction, dirt digging, dirt turning is gonna, is gonna be a reality in the next couple of years, which is super exciting. So this was, a, this was an, exi 
an area that I got to visit um, on the east side of the river that didn't have a levee that is kind of below the levee system. Um, it looks like open wetlands, but that ground is hard. You can stand on it with uh, with your own two feet. It's it's solid, solid sediment, and this is going to be a willow forest in the next 10 years. That's the power of the river to create habitat. So thank you so much. I um, appreciate y'all spending. Is Eric still with us? Are, yeah. are you frozen? Oh. You okay. have me back? Okay, yeah, yeah, good. There we are. All right. Yeah, sorry. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>